It's hard to believe Animal Crossing New Horizons has been out for a year now. It's also hard to believe we've all been stuck inside for like a year, but here we are, I guess. It's still pretty crazy just how perfect New Horizons release timing was. The game came out right at the start of a global pandemic where everyone was forced to stay inside, and Animal Crossing was the perfect game to relax with. And although I feel like the hype has died down pretty quickly, that hasn't stopped me from putting over 1000 hours into this game. For comparison, I played Animal Crossing New Leaf for about 830 hours over the course of 6 years. New Horizons has been out one year. So needless to say, I really like this game. However, that's not to say it is absolutely perfect. While New Horizons improves on a lot of the series' staple mechanics, I can't help but feel some of the new additions stumble a bit. And even a year later, there's still a lot of content from previous Animal Crossing games that just isn't in New Horizons. So today, I would like to offer my critique of New Horizons as someone who has played it every single day for an entire year. And I will also be joined by my friend Memorize, who is also a huge fan of New Horizons and has a few differing opinions from me. Hello. But given the nature of New Horizons and future game updates, parts of this critique may become outdated in the future. So please keep that in mind as we are only covering the first year of New Horizons. I doubt all of our criticisms will be addressed in future game updates, but I'll probably make another video like this after some more substantial updates are released. For now though, let's talk about Animal Crossing New Horizons. Animal Crossing New Horizons begins in the same way as every Animal Crossing game. You are traveling to a distant village that will soon become your very own sandbox to customize. However, for the first time in the series, this village isn't landlocked. You now have your very own island, and New Horizons takes advantage of this change by framing your travels as a tropical getaway. Before selecting your island, you are given the opportunity to customize your character. Diversity itself in Animal Crossing has changed significantly since New Leaf, which is great to see considering all societal changes in diversity acceptance in the past few years. From Mabel making sly comments when you buy clothing made for the opposite gender in New Leaf, gender itself has now been completely abolished in favour of style when you first make your character. Added to this, we finally get to have different skin tones right from the start, and this is great to see considering how Animal Crossing is a game about relatability and being able to immerse yourself into the tranquil island life of all types of people. It may be much more a simple part of the initial character customization, but it still goes a long way to make everyone feel as though they can have some sort of special experience compared to others, no matter who they are. Once you are done customizing your character, you are required to choose an island layout. But the choices don't matter as much as previous Animal Crossing games given the newly added terraforming and waterscaping tools. Upon unlocking the resident services building, you are able to purchase permits that allow you to change how the island looks. You can build cliffs, dig rivers, I think there was one person that made their island look like Danny DeVito. So like, <laughs> you can do a lot with these things. In my opinion, this is probably the best feature added to New Horizons. Terraforming and waterscaping allow for so much freedom and creativity, it's kind of insane. I have spent hours upon hours planning out and changing my island to the point where I've torn everything down and rebuilt it twice, and I am currently in the process of <laughs> rebuilding it again. Never before have you had this much freedom to control how your town looks. However, there are limitations to this feature. You can only have four layers of land, and the fourth layer cannot be scaled or built on, so it's just kinda pointless. I honestly have no clue why it's even there if you can't do anything with it. I'd rather add trees and decorations to my island's third layer rather than having a completely barren cliffside. Also nothing about the beach can be changed, meaning the river mouths you initially start with cannot be altered at all. When I first selected my island layout, this thought never crossed my mind. And now I'm stuck with two river mouths at the bottom of my island. Since then, I've had ideas for island layouts that require a river mouth on the side of my island, 
that are now impossible for me to make unless I just reset my save file. However, there are some very rewarding feelings which come from this seemingly inconvenient restriction. Being forced to work around what you chose at the beginning forces you to be more creative with your island and go outside of your original plan. While this may initially be deemed quite infuriating, the end result when you eventually find a way to fit what you are naturally given into your island creation is so satisfying and rewarding. For example, when I was redesigning my island, I was annoyed for my past self for not choosing an island with resident services which wasn't 5 feet away from my airport. However, after working my way around it, my island ended up looking better than I imagined, as the close resident services gave me more room to terraform behind it to produce a larger waterfall area. Another issue I have with terraforming and wirescaping is that they are very tedious to perform. Each individual cliffside or river needs to be constructed one tile at a time, which isn't much of an issue for smaller projects, but larger endeavors will take quite some time. Now, bear with me for a second, but I have devised a solution that some may find unbelievable. Pay close attention. Did you see that? <laughs> Just get rid of the second hit. It'll speed up the whole process immensely. It's really that simple. In the same vein as terraforming and waterscaping, you now have the ability to create actual paths on your island. I say actual paths because in previous Animal Crossing games, you were forced to lay down custom made design tiles in place of paths, which didn't look great but it's all we had really. You still have that ability in New Horizons, but the addition of actual pathmaking tools makes the whole process so much easier. The only issue I have with this addition is that the paths can't be laid out diagonally, which is odd considering both the cliffs and the rivers can be diagonal. The best looking diagonal path you can get is this, and yeah, that's not great. That being said, if you don't like the way the in-game paths look, there is an option to make custom paths and use them to make your island look more unique. This tool unlocks so much room for creativity and customization, allowing all islands to look even more diverse. The designs that people have made have been stunning and so inventive to the point where people have made islands purely based on custom designs. This has been a pivotal aspect of island creation that has really added a completely new level of detail and personalization to the island. But personally, I don't really like using custom designs, mainly because of the footstep sound effects usually not matching up with how the path looks. It just kind of kills my immersion a little, but I completely understand those who like using them. Another amazing addition is that you can finally move rocks. I had some rocks in my new leaf town that were in some absolutely terrible spots. And the fact that I could never relocate them bothered me a lot. But in New Horizons, you can break them after eating a fruit, and they'll respawn in a random location the next day. I do find it odd that you can't sit on rocks, though. In base New Leaf, you couldn't either. But then they added the ability to sit on rocks in the Welcome Amiibo update a few years after New Leaf came out. I don't know why they added that feature in a New Leaf update only to take it away in New Horizons. It's really not a big deal at all and doesn't affect my enjoyment of the game, it's just something really weird that I wanted to bring up that I don't really hear anybody else talking about. On the topic of New Leaf, something else that really bothered me in that game was how if you ran around your town, the grass would degrade over time. That doesn't happen in New Horizons, so I no longer feel punished for running around all over the place. This is especially good because the island is considerably larger than New Leaf's town, so getting around takes longer in general, so you are going to be running most of the time. But there's no penalty anymore. But funnily enough, when it comes to house customization, New Leaf had way bigger and more customizable homes than New Horizons. You could make your house into a modern apartment building, a castle, a Japanese castle. Like, it was awesome. And even the interior of the house was larger. The side rooms in New Leaf have much more space than in New Horizons. Which is really, really weird. Like, I was playing New Horizons, and once I realized I couldn't upgrade my house size anymore, I was like, 
Wait, that's it? And that's not even to mention the lack of furniture sets in New Horizons. There are some genuinely really cool items in New Horizons, but so much is missing from previous Animal Crossing games. The Robo Furniture? Gone. The Rococo set? Gone. Froggy Chair? Gone? Like, even Froggy Chair is gone. Like how, do, how, do they, how do they miss Froggy Chair? How, how is that not there? For example, here are a list of the sofas in New Horizons. And I'm not counting that one. That one is not a sofa. That is a bed. <laughs> that one's a bed. And now here are all of the sofas in New Leaf. And that's not even counting the couches, which are separate, but there's not as many of them. But still, all of those together is like five times <laughs> as many sofas than in New Horizons. That's just an estimate but I'm assuming it's around that amount. But I will say the act of moving furniture around the house is really good. Being able to access storage directly while moving stuff around is very convenient. They kind of nailed it with this actually, but the lack of furniture options is still pretty disappointing. However, you can put basically any furniture item outside now, which is actually insane. This simple change opens the door for deeper island customization. Yeah, terraforming and waterscaping are pretty cool, but I can actually put fences around my house, or grills and towels on the beach. This feature completely replaces public works projects from New Leaf, and a few of the old public works projects are just regular items now. Public works projects always bothered me because it was completely random when you got access to them. It took me three whole years to get a windmill <laughs> in my New Leaf town. I am so happy, I don't need to worry about that anymore. Even though the windmill <laughs> is not an item in New Horizons <laughs> yet. Hopefully it's added, but <laughs> still. Another direct change from New Leaf is the ability to move buildings. It was so annoying when villagers moved directly in the middle of a path or somewhere else you didn't want them to. But in New Horizons, not only can you choose where villagers move in, but you can also move any building aside from resident services. Gone are the days of covering up your entire town with custom designs to move a villager into a specific spot, and that is something I totally did a bunch in New Leaf. But moving buildings can be a bit tedious because if you want to move, say, a house over one space, you can't just move it that one space. The new plot and the existing house can't overlap, so you need to move the house twice to get it right where you want it. I feel like that's a common theme in this game. Like it makes so many good changes, but these changes have issues and they haven't been perfected. Like that's a that's a big overarching theme in this game in my opinion. And I also feel like New Horizons is missing a lot of the shops and facilities from previous Animal Crossing games. Nook's Cranny only has one upgrade, the fortune teller shop is nowhere to be seen, Kicks and Leaf visit your island randomly instead of having permanent shops, the cafe still hasn't been added to the game yet, and I've had an open plot ready for the cafe since, like, June? To me, the island feels a bit lacking in places to go. But you could argue that many people actually enjoy the lack of buildings as it gives the game more of a natural deserted island feeling. In a way, the lack of buildings forces you to use nature's elements to craft your island around the flora that the island provides, giving your island a natural core element even with city builds. Not to mention the nice change of pace this provides compared to the main street of New Leaf and other previous Animal Crossing games, as well as a sense of isolation which further emphasises that connection to nature which the island has. The fact that there are no inhabitants before you get there means that no one has tainted with the island's greenery, giving you a blank slate of grass and trees to build from the ground up, which is perfect for this game with a huge emphasis on building everything yourself. Animal Crossing New Horizons definitely brings a lot new to the table in terms of customization. Whether it be customizing your island to look exactly how you want it to, or interior decorating, there's a lot of features in this game. And while it did fix a lot of the problems I had with New Leaf, it did so in ways that aren't perfect solutions, but they do help. 
Animal Crossing is the kind of game where you either don't really get into it, or spend hundreds of hours doing menial tasks like watering flowers and interior decorating. But at its core, that's kind of what Animal Crossing is. It's a game about doing small tasks and slowly building up your town into something you can be proud of. That's the reason why Animal Crossing jives so well with me. I love how relaxed and chill it is. I love wandering around late at night and listening to the amazing soundtrack. I love exploring the museum, which got a massive overhaul in New Horizons and looks absolutely gorgeous. I love setting goals for myself and realizing these goals over time. And although my excitement for New Horizons has died down more recently, there were nights where I went to sleep with legitimate excitement to play it the next morning. But coming from someone who has played Animal Crossing New Horizons every single day for the past year, the content does get pretty repetitive. There have definitely been some days where I feel like I have forced myself to play out of some obligation. Whenever I play New Horizons, my daily routine goes something like this. Check my mail, search for fossils, get my fossils examined, sell my fossils, and check the stock in Nook's Cranny. Check for clothes in the Able Sisters, check in on my villagers, hit some rocks, harvest a bell tree, plant a bell tree, find the daily DIY recipe in a bottle, access the Nook terminal, find the daily visitor, and sometimes interact with them. I'm sorry, Label, I just don't care. <laughs> Once all of these tasks have been completed, then I get to work on some of the more long-term projects I have going. If I feel like it. Not every day I feel like it. My island is an absolute mess at the moment, so I've been working on giving it a complete overhaul, and that's taking a lot longer than I expected. But tedium is really what Animal Crossing boils down to a lot of the time. It can be relaxing tedium, like trying to catch bugs and fish late at night, but there are some elements in New Horizons that fall into the more frustrating side of tedium. A common example I've seen people complain about is crafting items. For example, if you want to make bait for fishing, you need to make each individual bait one at a time. The same goes for something like buying Nook Miles tickets. You can't just select how many you want to buy. You need to buy one, wait for it to be given to you, mash through the dialog box, and then select the next one. If you've amassed a huge number of Nook Miles, then this process can take way longer than it should. This repetitiveness is also shown when you try buy items from Nook's Cranny such as customization kits. While a lot of items take up a lot of kits to customise, you can only buy 5 at a time, making a simple shopping trip turn into a long laborious chore. This isn't even something that should take a long time to fix, so why this hasn't been updated is beyond me. Even interacting with your villagers can be tedious. I often find myself avoiding conversation because their dialogue is so boring most of the time. There just isn't enough variety. One time I talked to Bob, literally walked like 5 steps to talk to Sherb, and he said the exact same thing. And the villagers don't even really do anything in this game. In previous games they'd visit your house and play games like hide and seek, but now they just stand there most of the time. There is one game you can play with them though, which is the treasure hunt, and that's alright. I got Bob's photo from doing one, which was pretty cool. And it is pretty cute when the villagers like sing or work out, but I do wish they felt more like living, breathing characters. And I know it's too late for this to happen, but it would have been great if two more personality types were introduced to spice things up a little. Currently there are 8 personality types villagers can have, and villagers of the same personality share dialogue. Because you can have 10 villagers on your island, it would have been amazing if there were 10 personality types. If that were the case, you wouldn't need to have an overlap in personalities, and every single villager could be unique. It also really bothers me that the first 5 villagers you start with will always have boring furniture in their houses. After you unlock the campsite, any villager that moves in will have a house interior designed around their aesthetic. I have absolutely no clue why villagers don't get updated homes when you unlock the campsite, because the crummy starting furniture sets just make your villagers less valuable. Their houses just don't have any personality. 
However, the new villages they added to New Horizons for the most part are really good and uniquely designed. Highlights include some of the most popular villagers such as Sherb, Judy, Oddy, Dom and of course the Marmite villager that's Raymond. I personally love how bright and unique a lot of them look, Judy being pretty much the definition of pastel colours and Audi looking like she's perfectly ready for summer again. Not to mention the story behind Audi's name, which was a very nice tribute to one of the most famous Animal Crossing fans. I would also like to offer a formal apology for a video I posted last year around this time. My friends and I made an Animal Crossing villager tier list that somehow got picked up by the YouTube algorithm, so unfortunately, a lot of people heard me say that I liked Raymond because I thought he was a funny business cat. And at the time, that's what I thought he was. But then I found out about what Twitter had done to him. So needless to say, that video does not reflect the current values of my channel. And I actually haven't run into Raymond yet, which is surprising considering how many times I've been villager hunting. Oh yeah, that's a thing you can do now. There's a new currency in New Horizons called Nook Miles, and they basically act as rewards for completing in-game achievements. Some of these achievements are long-term, but there are daily challenges you can complete to receive Nook Miles, which is actually really great. Nook Miles can then be exchanged for items, but the most useful thing to buy are Nook Miles tickets. Nook Miles tickets can then be presented at the airport for a trip to a random Nook Miles island. These islands can contain materials, rare fish, money rocks, and even villagers if you have an open home plot on your island. Hunting for villagers has been one of my favorite activities in this game. I just love seeing what I can find. My only issue with this feature is that villagers only appear on these islands if you have less than 10 villagers on your island. It can take a while before one of your villagers wants to move out, so villager hunting doesn't happen too often. I really wish you could find villagers even if your island is full, and then just have the new villagers kick someone out. You can do that with amiibo villagers, so I don't know why you can't do that here. Another big change for the series is the addition of crafting. Various items Items and tools can be made from materials found on your island, and new crafting recipes can be found in washed up bottles, balloon presents, some can be purchased in the shop, others are given to you by villagers. Crafting is a massive part of this game, and I like it. Not every piece of furniture can be crafted, but the ones that can be are usually pretty unique, and collecting materials is pretty good too. I especially like the shooting star events where you can wish on stars, which then cause star fragments to wash up on the beach the next morning. Interacting with the world in this way is really fun. And events like this do happen on occasion. There's fishing tournaments, bug catching tournaments, there's fireworks in the summer, different holiday events. Oh, oh no. It's that time of year again. Bunny day is upon us. I cannot tell you how awful the Bunny Day event was last year. The main issue with Bunny Day was that the eggs began appearing on your island a few weeks before the event actually began, and these eggs appeared everywhere. In the ground, in trees, in the rivers, in the sky, in my nightmares. Okay, that was an exaggeration, but the real problem was that there was a fishing tournament during this event and everyone kept fishing up eggs instead of fish. Congratulations, Zipper, you ruined the fishing tournament. If we look at holidays as a whole throughout the year, there's a common theme of activities being fairly boring, but the items being really well designed and detailed. For example, if we look at the wedding update, there is a huge variety of items to get, all of which look really good and fit into numerous themed islands. But the activity of getting them gets boring after a little while of just cluttering the room with items and taking a photo each time every day for a whole month. While this does promote the use of Halved Island and allows you to be more creative with the pictures you take, after about 5 days of the same thing, it just seems like more of a drag to get all the heart crystals and less of a fun event I look forward to each day. Now, there is but one more major activity to talk about. Something so vile, so boring, that not even the most hardcore Animal Crossing player will defend it. I am talking about online multiplayer. First of all, online multiplayer takes way too long to get going. There's so many dialogue boxes to get through, and once you do, there's long loading screens that everyone needs to watch whenever someone visits. Gameplay grinds to a halt, it's just so annoying. 
But you may be asking yourself, oh, well, waiting is worth it, right? There's gotta be a lot of fun things to do with friends. Well, no. The only thing you can really do is walk around their town, fish, catch bugs, and take a massive shit. There are no mini games to play with friends like a new leaf. You can't move furniture around or anything. It's just not worth the time and needs some sort of revamp. Otherwise, I'd rather just look at screenshots or videos of my friends' islands. Animal Crossing New Horizons has definitely worn off quickly for some. Not everyone enjoys the repetitive nature of the game, and even those that do will probably agree that certain activities are lackluster. However, for those that seek a more laid-back game that can be played in short bursts, Animal Crossing New Horizons accomplishes this goal pretty well. Animal Crossing New Horizons is a game both Memorize and I have found a lot of joy in. It's fun, relaxing, and it's nice to see our islands grow over time. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of the game in this video, and there's still a lot to talk about. But I believe we've covered our main criticisms, as well as the most important content within New Horizons. The game isn't without its flaws, and we're not without our criticisms, but we still love New Horizons, even a year later. Sure, the updates have been kind of lackluster and disappointing, but it's good to know that they're still updating the game and they haven't completely abandoned it yet, so hopefully the updates start getting better in the future and we get some more items and facilities and stuff like that. But as it stands right now, I am still playing New Horizons, I really love this game, and I plan on continuing to play it for years and years to come, and I'm probably gonna put a few more thousand hours into this game knowing me, which is kind of crazy to think about because there's so much else I could be doing, but hey. What are you gonna do? <laughs>